everyone. Uh, thank you, Darren. Uh, when I was thinking about what I might say in this presentation, uh, a colleague said I should aim for the Gettysburg Address effect. He explained that most of those attending uh, at Gettysburg were actually very disappointed with Abraham Lincoln's short speech. However, over the next century or so, his Gettysburg Address became widely recognised as one of the greatest speeches of all time. Now, it's very tempting to think that what I might say here today will eventually be regarded as a major contribution to political oratory, but you'll forgive me, I'm sure, if I opt instead to be less ambitious and to concentrate instead on the important, if less than momentous, issues that we are here to consider. As Darren says, we're really encouraged by the interest in today's uh, event and the fact that 280 people registered for this seminar within 36 hours uh, shows a considerable level of interest and possibly also a little concern about the health regulations, health research regulations made by the Minister in August under the Data Protection Act 2018. So the purpose of my presentation is to put the regulations in context to explain what we've done, why we've done it and where we propose to go from here. And that last point will be taken up further by my colleague uh, Theresa Maguire in her presentation. So to begin, what is the purpose of the health research regulations? Quite simply, their purpose is to support health research and promote necessary and desirable public confidence in such research. The value of health research is indisputable and indispensable. A research-informed health and social care service means enhanced care for patients, it promotes the recruitment and retention of outstanding clinicians, it ensures the best returns on health care expenditure, and it supports broader government goals of employment and economic gain. For all those reasons, Ireland as a country is constantly striving to be the best when it comes to health research. The government is therefore committed to the continued development of a research active health system in Ireland. That commitment has already seen significant public investment in physical infrastructure, personnel, uh, new skills and technology, and that commitment will continue. In terms of competitiveness, as these regulations represent best practice, they should stand Ireland in good stead for Horizon 2020 and beyond. At the same time, the government is equally determined to ensure good research governance, as well as appropriate and streamlined regulatory processes, including the reform of research ethics structures, which Theresa will talk about later this morning. In all of this, the trust of patients is critical to ensuring a vibrant, innovative and well-regulated health research sector. That public support is most likely when there is transparency and engagement and where patients feel empowered in relation to their health information, which they rightly regard as highly personal and extremely sensitive. If the public lose confidence in the way the health system handles their information, especially in the, in the way it is disclosed by data controllers, it won't only be the health research that suffers, but all aspects of the health system. I want to now turn to the legal framework within which we operate, since it defined what needed to be and what couldn't be included in the health research regulations. The general data protection regulation cannot be viewed in isolation. It is part of a wider legal framework applicable to health research in Ireland. Consequently, when preparing the regulations, we also had to factor in the applicable international and national legal elements over and above the GDPR and the Data Protection Act. Those elements include the Irish Constitution and the right to privacy, the common law duty of confidentiality, which is at the heart of the doctor-patient relationship, and the rights of individuals in relation to their health information under the European Convention on Human Rights and the related case law of the European Court. They remain as relevant as ever, and consent is, of course, very much to the fore in each of those areas. And to make this point, I will quote very briefly from a, a report in August of this year from the European Court of Human Rights, and it reads as follows, and it's a, it's a quote worth reflecting on. It says, respecting the confidentiality of health data is a vital principle in the legal systems of all contracting parties to the Convention. It is crucial not only to respect the sense of privacy of a patient, but also to preserve his or her confidence in the medical profession and in the health services in general. Without such protection, those in need of medical assistance may be deterred from revealing such information of a personal and intimate nature as may be necessary in order to receive appropriate treatment and even from seeking such assistance. They may thereby endanger their own health and, in the case of transmissible diseases, that of the community. 
The domestic law must therefore afford appropriate safeguards to prevent any such communication or disclosure of personal health data as may be inconsistent with the guarantees in Article 8 of the Convention, which deal with human rights. I will address consent directly later in the presentation. And before that, I want to say a little about our engagement with the Data Protection Commission and the regulations. Our engagement with the Data Protection Commission was, and I better be careful with Kyle speaking next, but it was always interesting. Uh, we had many meetings uh, and discussions were frank but constructive. And in fact, it's fair to say that we both share common goals. The department wanting to promote health research and enhance public confidence, and the commission supportive of health research that respects the rights of data subjects. In terms of emphasis, we as a national data protection authority understandably focused on the need to protect the rights of data subjects. They insisted on safeguards as required by the GDPR that protected personal health data and the ability of patients to determine what happens to their information. It is important that I take this opportunity to say that this issue of patient empowerment is not just a data protection one, but rather something that goes to the heart of what a patient-centered health service really looks like. I also need to mention at this point that the department had to fully engage with the Attorney General's office and be guided by its advice both on drafting and substantive matters in relation to the health research regs. So after all the engagement, what exactly is in the health research regulations? The regulations are in fact very straightforward. That was written by Peter. <laughs> they are suitable and specific safeguards as required under Article 92J of the GDPR. They begin with a definition of health research and cover new research and research that was ongoing at the time the regulations were made. They then set out the applicable requirements for health research involved the processing of personal data, including consent and research ethics committee approval. They next addressed the situation the obtaining of explicit consent by a data controller for the use of personal data in a research project proves not to be possible. That may lead to an application to an independent and broadly based consent declaration committee to be appointed very soon by the Minister. The consent declaration process in the regulation sets out for the first time in Irish law a formal mechanism to allow for a consent declaration in health research in certain situations. And this we regard as significantly supportive of health research. We understand that some RECs were granting consent waivers to researchers in the, in the past in good faith and often following extensive consideration and deliberation. Uh, but it became clear early on that these didn't have a legal basis, that many research ethics committees were ill-equipped to consider the complex private and technical considerations that arise, and that a more formal solution uh, was necessary. I have referenced the overall legal framework, including at Supreme Court level, that places considerable emphasis on the public interest value of confidentiality and consent when it comes to personal health information. Anything that limits patient confidentiality and consent must itself have very strong countervailing public interest grounds. In earlier interactions we had with the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner on previous draft legislation, they advised that there were only three legal grounds allowing for the processing of personal data for health research. The first was anonymization of the personal data concerned. The second was a specific provision in legislation allowing for research without consent in relation to the matters covered by that legislation. And the third was explicit consent. In our engagement with the DPC on the health research regulations, the Commission noted that the requirement for explicit consent as the default position was a continuation of what was already law rather than any innovation. And that's an important point. Uh, GDPR is very much represents continuity with the, the legal arrangements that preceded it. it. It just amplifies the responsibility for transparency and clarity of communication with, with data subjects and with citizens. Moreover, the legal requirement for consent is very much in line with accepted international best practice in health research. It is therefore an appropriate safeguard and one that we want to build our research system around. What about other jurisdictions? In short, they differ. Looking at the UK, their health research authority in its guidance material says, consent meets ethical expectations to promote the autonomy and privacy of research participants. You might be thinking, but didn't the HRA also say that consent should not be used as a legal basis for health research? That's true, they did. But if you read down to the end of their advice, they helpfully point out that you still need consent to meet the common law duty of confidentiality. 
and that's why there's a confidentiality advisory group in the UK to make decisions and applications for consent exemptions. And we've based our consent declaration committee on that model. Consent cannot lawfully be given, even when someone has signed a document indicating his or her consent, unless it is informed. That means that the person requested to give consent has been provided with as much information as he or she requires to make an informed decision. It's not required that they read the information given. The important thing is that they are provided with the information in an easy to understand way, given time to read and digest it, and freedom to ask any questions that they wish. It's especially important that it is made clear that the decision not to consent will not impact on any care or treatment they receive, and that they can withdraw consent without any negative consequences. Crucially, they must also be assured that if they do not wish to give consent, that no attempt will be made to access their data and that no application will be made for a consent exemption to the Health Research Consent Declaration Committee afterwards. As regards explicit consent, in simple but clear terms, it is best described as informed consent that has been recorded. That protects both the researcher and the data subject if arguments subsequently arise as to what was agreed. We have prepared guidance on this area which can usefully be included in patient information leaflets. It is available, as Darren says, on the HRB website and there's quite a lot of material now on that and it's growing as we respond to the, the, the queries coming through. A researcher should also uh, consult the Article 29 Working Party guidance on transparency which is also available on the HRB website. Where broad consent is being sought, it's particularly important for the researcher to provide such information as is necessary and appropriate so that the individual knows what he or she is consenting to. The regulations address the question of broad consent in line with Recital 33 of the GDPR and the Article 29 Working Party Guidance on Consent. The regulations state that explicit consent can be obtained for the purposes of specified health research either in relation to a particular area or more generally in that area or a related area of health research. This is somewhat wider than envisaged by the EU Commission, but in framing the regulations, we were very concerned to give a re as reasonable a degree of scope as possible uh, for that exploratory side of, of health research and the open-endedness that's needed in discovery. However, to be absolutely clear, blanket consent for future unspecified or unrelated purposes is not an option, should not be sought, because if it is, it will be invalid. As regards biobanking and clinical trials for medical products, the GDPR applies to the processing of personal data associated with biobank material or the clinical trial. Where clinical trials are concerned, involvement in the trial must be voluntary, informed, and in line with the current EU clinical trials directive and statutory instruments in this area, which are set to be replaced by the new clinical regulations agreed in 2014. This ensures that participants can be fully advised of the processing of their personal data associated with the trial. As the health research regulations derive directly from the GDPR as suitable and specific measures that must be met, the processing of personal data in clinical trials must comply with the regulations. As regards biobanks, the GDPR does not apply to biological samples per se, but it does apply fully to the personal data associated with those samples, as do these regulations when that processing is for research purposes. In relation to biobanks and broad consent, Evolving best practice and recommenda recommendations in the field of biobanking research, even in advance of GDPR, is for researchers to try to the greatest extent possible to describe future uses and to provide information on governance and objectives of the biobank. A number of additional information requirements apply where biobanks are concerned, and they are set out in our guidance notes referred to earlier. What has not existed in Irish law until the regulations was any mechanism to cover the scenario where a health research project cannot obtain consent. We understand that some research ethics committees may have believed that they had the power to give waivers. As I said, those waivers have no legal standing. The amount of detail required in the regulations to establish a lawful consent declaration process is a clear indication of just how rigorous the process has to be to be lawful. The new statutory mechanism covers a situation where the research is of high public importance and where obtaining consent for the use of the information is not possible. As the regulations make clear, the consent declaration process does not extend to the subsequent disclosure of that information by the data controller who obtains a consent declaration. I want to dispel two possible misunderstandings about the new consent declaration process. First of all, no one is being required to apply to the committee. 
Any decision to apply to the committee is for the health researcher to make, having carefully assessed whether or not they are likely to meet the criteria and conditions set out in the regulations. Second, the committee is not there as an alternative to seeking consent. Quite the opposite. Uh, the committee will need, as a starting point, tangible evidence to support a claim that obtaining consent is not possible. For that reason, the committee should never be the first option for a researcher. It should be the last. I also want to make it clear that the committee is not intended to take over the functions of research ethics committees. Research ethics committees play a separate, distinct and very important role in the health research process. However, it is envisaged that the committees will engage with RECs so that health research in Ireland can benefit from the existence of both. The department is committed to making this happen. This can be seen as another step in the department's plan to develop a new health research policy that maps out defined structures with associated clear roles that work efficiently and effectively. While the regulations are focused on new research, we also had to consider the matter of how best to deal with currently ongoing research projects. We identified two situations that needed to be addressed. The first is where explicit consent was obtained with due regard to ensuring that it was in line with the requirements of the previous legislation, the EU Data Protection Directive and the Data Protection Acts 88 and 2003, but where such explicit consent would fail the more rigorous test of the GDPR. The Article 29 Working Party and Consent is of the view that the health researcher should normally be expected to go back to the data subject and seek re-consent. However, we recognise that there may well be projects where despite reasonable and verifiable efforts to re-consent to recontact all data subject, it was not possible to do so. And fairness seems to require that in such situations, some accommodation be provided to the researcher, counterbalanced by measures that appropriately protect the data subjects involved. Accordingly, the regulations allow an application to be made to the Consent Declaration Committee where efforts to reconsent before 30th of April next year prove problematic. The second situation relating to currently ongoing health research is more problematic. It is where consent has not been obtained for such research or, which there, or where there is no record of the consent obtained. We have no evidence that failure to obtain consent is widespread, but it's reasonable to conclude that it has happened. One option we faced was that nothing could be done to address the absence of consent that should have been obtained. As with reconsenting, we pushed for these research projects to be allowed to rectify that situation before the 30th of April 2019. We were also very mindful that a failure to obtain consent could potentially result in some very worthwhile health research being shut down without any consideration of the value of the research. In such circumstances, it seems fair to allow a case to be made to the committee for what would be a retrospective consent declaration. This would be subject, of course, to all the data protection safeguards that would apply to a new project seeking such a declaration. I have to emphasise that this facility to go to the committee is not a get-out-of-jail card for poor research practice. There would be considerable onus on the researcher to explain why consent was not obtained in the first instance in those cases. Decisions on who gets a consent declaration are not made by the minister, the department or the HRB. They are to be made solely by the independent committee with an appeal process to another equally independent panel. It is therefore for health researchers to make the case and satisfy the committee, including, for example, demonstrating the reasonable efforts they have made for reconsenting, which will necessarily be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. The best guidance that, that be offered is to make as complete a convincing, uh, and convincing a case as possible. Before finishing, I want to acknowledge three specific matters that I know health researchers and research edit committees are concerned with at present. The first relates to retrospective chart reviews and problems posed by lack of consent. Given the low risk involved with chart reviews, we are examining possible ways of abbreviating the process in the regulations. However, any solution will have to be consistent with the parameters of GDPR and protecting the rights of data subjects. It cannot be otherwise. It's important also to point out that the issue does not arise from the health research regulations, but relates to why patients were not advised by hospitals at the time of admission, during their stay or at the time of discharge, that their records might be used for retrospective reviews. This has to change going forward. The second is consent waivers obtained for research from RECs previously. We recognise that these waivers were obtained in good faith and we are therefore minded to try to find an arrangement to deal sympathetically with the research projects involved, subject again to consistency with GDPR. The third area is capacity to consent and this is a matter that extends far beyond health research and even the health sector. 
While I'm aware that the previous Data Protection Acts allowed certain persons to make decisions on behalf of others, that limited framework was wholly superseded by the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Act of 2015. The health research regulations did not change the law on capacity and they cannot be amended to address capacity rules <coughs> since they are, were set out in advance in 2015. However, we are sensitive to the issues raised and are working with others to come up with guidance in this area pending the commencement of the provisions of the 2015 Act. I'm happy to say that Cahill has indicated that the DPC will look at any draft guidance that is developed so we will know that we are on a sure footing from a data protection perspective. I'm aware that I've covered a great deal of ground in my presentation, uh, but it was important to address the areas as full as possible in order to give a proper context. And when I looked up the, um, the Gettysburg Address and the event around it to, to commemorate the graves, the, the key speaker was a guy called Edward Everett, who spoke before Abraham Lincoln, and he went on for about two hours and a half, so <laughs> maybe I'm more like him. Um, so, I, 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 importantly, I just want to sort of again uh, express our appreciation for the interest that people have shown in this. I want to express our, our appreciation to the HRB for their Trojan work in, in, in working with us on this. And I really look forward to this morning and to us working together as an Irish health research community to ensure that we build a really solid foundation uh, based on trust and confidence to support a very vibrant and dynamic health research going forward. In my own, in the, as regards to the department, I want to pay tribute to Theresa Maguire and to Peter Lennon, uh, who lead on this in the department. And uh, it's a phenomenal amount of work, and it's led by, on, on, on very few shoulders, and that's why we rely on, on, on the broader support. And I want to thank Peter and Theresa for their, their ongoing work on this. I want to sum up my presentation by saying that the regulations set out for the first time in Irish legislation sound information governance principles that are in line with international best practice when it comes to the collection, use and disclosure of a patient's personal health data for health research. The regulations will also ensure there is certainty, consistency and clarity for those carrying out health research on what the rules are and that is a major step forward. For data subjects they ensure openness and transparency. That is surely something every person in this room would agree is desirable and worthwhile. Thank you.